Welcome to this week's edition of Debriefing the Law. I am Joel Oster. I am Chris Marone. And Chris, it is great to be back. I do want to give a word to our listeners. Why have we been gone for a couple of weeks? You might look at my eye and say, Joel, did you get in some kind of fight? What's going on? Is that why you were out for the last couple of weeks? No, mm -hmm. uh, more on why my eye is that color a little bit later, but we had some issues with Apple Podcasts. So today we're actually going to be releasing two different podcasts. One is going to be part two of the Easter trial, the Easter story trial. Uh, mm -hmm. that, was, that, was a, that was a great podcast that we did that I think only a handful of you actually listened to. And then we found out the Apple Podcast stopped carrying our podcast. Lest you think it's some Weird. kind of Trump conspiracy. I don't think it's that. Uh, I think it's probably something happened with the feed. I don't know what. So we had to reset our feed. Turns out I didn't set up this podcast. My marketing manager didn't set it up. My previous marketing manager didn't set it up. We had to go back three marketing managers. She set it up using her own Apple ID. Well, we can't find uh. her now. So we couldn't actually get this back online. Whatever, we found a way at the end of the day, and I hope that we are now back on Apple Podcasts, because apparently Same. that's how most people listen to, to these podcasts. Hey. That's how I do it. Chris, the I. So I, yeah, I got to tell you, did you say hit you? I did. Is that some Absolutely. kind of infamous thing you're trying to say? That's how it I is. got this? I somehow I lost a fight? Are you think I lost a fight? Yeah. Uh, actually, 100% thinking you lost. Look, the... Your KU Jayhawks didn't do great in this final four this time around. Somebody <laughs> probably ran their mouth about how, you know, boiler up or Purdue this or something like that. And you had to defend the honor true of your KU Jayhawks. You say that true story. So this is actually several years ago now. And I'm on my I'm going to uh, Naples, Florida to speak to a gathering. Okay. And I'm going to speak okay. on a, a Supreme Court case that I was involved with. And yep. so, you know, I'm, I'm speaking to this group. And it's going to be about a thousand people there uh, about a Supreme Court case. And on the way there, I stop off at a family reunion. Now, Chris, these family reunions mm, get competitive. Fair. We call yep. them the Buttermore Olympics because we have all kinds of sports that we play in. One of those sports was basketball. Well, I am a competitive guy and I had to okay. grab this rebound. One of my um, uh, cousins, I won't say his name, gave me an elbow to the face. And so I'm going to this meeting with a big old black shiner way bigger than this uh eye but that was a great talking point because i was able to tell the, the audience yeah but you should have seen the aclu attorney uh he got yeah. it a lot worse <laughs> all right well as far as this one i did lose a fight it was a fight with my golden doodle and apparently golden doodles can pack a punch and i was playing with her in the morning i got a little too rambunctious so she gets her paws out there to kind of swat me and i caught one right there in the eye with her claws Bam. So, yes, she is going to the groomer here soon to get those daggers <laughs> reduced a, a little bit. So I got a little black eye going on, but mm -hmm. no reason to stay hidden in the in the basement. All right. I mean, also this last week, we had O.J. Simpson passed away. So, Chris, let's let the musings begin. Uh, so I the know you juice see... is loose, man. The juice is loose. Does Does this bring out the best of us or the worst of us? I don't know. I mean, it's comedic gold at this point, right? Like all the all the jokes, all the all the really bad taste jokes are coming out. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of that in my feeds. Um, but it, the man died of cancer. I feel bad for anybody who has to go through that sort of exit from this world. But comedic gold, so many. I saw a picture of a Ford Bronco elongated into a hearse that said OJ's last ride, and I. <laughs> almost spit my drink out of my mouth uh i've seen okay, like that's good that's a good one like i see uh there was a video like a like a clip of oj and aaron hernandez talking in hell like i thought that was hilarious um again dark humor not not in the best taste but there's there's been some good comedic stuff coming out of the the oj simpson passing 
Well, it is a good time to go over the O.J. Simpson trial. So in today's podcast, I'm going to give you a little bit of a heads up of what we're going to talk about. Uh, O.J. Simpson trial remembered a lot of interesting things from that. Yeah. That case is definitely one of the trials of the century. So we're going to start off with the O.J. trial. Remembered Trump's trial, a criminal trial in New York City mm-hmm. starts next Monday. We'll give you a little bit of a set that case up for for you. And then the Supreme Court, the G- January 6th defendant is at the supreme court next week yeah. arguing to get one of his charges thrown out and then we're going to finish Crazy. with a little cato caitlin caitlin clark controversy uh and so stay tuned to our courtroom quarterback segment oh it's a controversy you, it's not we, a controversy chris we need to bump our ratings up it's a controversy that's, that's right fight it out joel fight, <laughs> right. fight, 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 fight. do we but first do, joel we need to pay the bills we got to pay the bills. This podcast is brought to you by not 7-Eleven and not Quick Trip, though we really should get them as sponsors. That would be nice. Really should. Uh, nice comedian trip. of Law. We do CLEs that educate and entertain. There's no reason, Chris, for you to bring your pillow to your continuing legal education class. You can actually learn and stay awake at the same time. There actually is Novelty. no law prohibiting you from, from actually enjoying the CLE experience. Well, we Absolutely. will we will allow you to enjoy the CLE experience. By the way, Chris, um, let me also throw this out there. We have a cruise coming up, a CLE destination cruise, the first one that Comedian of Law is going to do. And by the way, Chris, can I tell you, it will not be our last. Absolutely. We have Absolutely. 39 people sign up for this cruise. Shut up. I am amazed. That's I had, insane. I had no idea we're going to get that many signed right. up. So, yes, this will not be the last. This will be the first of many because I love to travel. We're going to go talk about the Socrates wow. trial over there. But there is still room for you to sign up. I think I heard there's a couple cabins left on the entire ship. This ship is selling out and selling out quickly. So, But there are cancellations. If you want to go on a cruise and you want to get your CLE hours. Yeah. Or heck, if you're just interested in the Socrates trial, which is an amazing yeah. trial that impacts our legal system today, sign up. Check out that cruise. Right. Mediterranean cruise of Joel. I would be there if my wife didn't already book another trip that oh, I have to go on. Hey, you know what, Chris? There Family will be more. obligations. There will be more in the future. And I'm telling you Absolutely. what, you and I... And on a cruise ship buffet line, we could do some damage oh, to that. Absolutely, they're going to lose money. <laughs> they with will. Us on the buffet they line. will be raising rates for the next cruise. All right, that's right. OJ trial <laughs> remembered. OJ. Chris, this, Ooh, the juice. I almost hate to go down this road because it will highlight how much older I am than you. Uh, no, man, just, I won't mention anything. You already did. Because it, it, we're going to talk about where we were during Ooh, the okay. trial. And what are you going to say? I was in the sixth grade. <laughs> I was in law school. I was school. in elementary school. <laughs> I was in law school class, all right? Uh, well, I mean, you have a better perspective. I was in the sixth grade, man. We took a straw poll in class, and everybody was like, OJ, he's in the naked gun. This was like post-OJ's like football career, too. Bunch of sixth graders don't know it OJ played in the NFL. Career. Right, right. Right. Like it, sixth graders were just like, it's OJ Simpson and it's a trial. And my parents have really bad takes on this. <laughs> so what so, do you what are your favorite? I hate to say favorite, but we'll just say most no. memorable memories from the OJ trial. To, to start off with, I gotta admit, I was a huge OJ fan. I have OJ's football card. Granted, it was uh-huh. with him with the San Francisco 49ers and not the Buffalo oh, yeah. Bills. Uh, he did yeah. end his career there, but I was a huge OJ fan. I read yeah. his a biography, and he started his life out with rickets, uh, you know, a, a crippling yeah. disease of the legs. Oh, he becomes yeah. one of the best running backs in the history of the NFL. First running back mm-hmm. to rush for over 2,000 yards in a yep. season back when they did not have 17 games to do it. It's a little right. bit of a spoiler alert for our Cato Clark uh, discussion later on. Caitlin. Caitlin, Caitlin Clark, Clark, not Cato. Cato <laughs> is OJ's best friend, there not the number one college scorer in the history of time. But that's a well, and that's Chris, another discussion. That's why I have you on this podcast. You can set me exactly. straight from the crazy stuff that I say. Um, so you don't say Cato Clark. Yeah, uh, there, there's a lot of very interesting, memorable things about this trial. Oh my gosh, yes. So let's just go over some of these um, memorable parts. Uh, again, I am a huge OJ fan. Um, I, you already mm-hmm. mentioned the Naked Gun. 
Yep. Chris, I have promised him make a gun, make a gun a two and a half, and make a gun thirty three and a third umpteen times. Those are my favorite movies. My wife even bought them for me on videotape. Do you remember what a videotape Ooh, is, Chris? I do remember what a VHS tape is. Okay. I don't think some of our younger listeners have any clue what a VHS tape is. I got all three of them on VHS. So Look at you. <laughs> not that I can Look watch them you. now on VHS. Right. But uh, I so didn't I, see a VHS player at Target last night when I was there buying some things, and I was very, very surprised to see a VHS standalone, not a VHS DVD, just a straight VCR. Wow. Where, yeah. where do you live? Yeah. Phoenix, bro. <laughs> up there in um, Alaska, the, the, the remote parts <laughs> of Alaska. All right. Well, yeah. let's go ahead. Let's just talk a little bit about the, so, yeah, the, let's do the, the juice. OJ trial. Uh, let's start with the uh, when you actually first heard about the murder. Do you remember where you were when you heard about it? Honestly, I the 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 triggering event for the Chris Marone OJ Simpson intersection was the white Bronco chase. Okay. I like I didn't. No, like, again, sixth grade, man. You're not really aware of what's going on in the world. Murders happen. You know, there's stuff on the news about murders all the time, um, even even back then. But it was the white Bronco chase that, like, monopolized every single TV station, including right. ESPN, when I was a kid. And so, of course, I'm like, why are we following a white Bronco? Like, what the hey? I remember being oh. in my car, uh, listening to the radio, hearing a report mm -hmm. about Nicole uh, Brown Simpson being murdered and, and Ron Goldman. And in my mind thinking, wow, I sure hope OJ was not involved with this. I can't wait till he gets cleared. I want to, clearly, he, he couldn't have done this, but who would have clearly. done it? I remember having those thoughts from the very, very beginning because he was that much of a hero in my mind. I didn't even want to entertain the thought that OJ might have, have done this. But you mentioned the chase. Yeah. The chase is one of those interesting things that most people oh can gosh. remember where they were. It happened Cultural, during a yeah. NBA Finals game that I was watching. Yeah. I believe it was the I, New York Knicks versus I forget who they were playing actually. Do you know why? Oh, Houston, Houston, Houston. Yeah. Oh my God, that that that's how memorable that series was. But also, like, it was the first. I I don't know in my lifetime. Again, I was a young kid at that point, but it was like the first. I think personal experience of um the type of journalism that really isn't important in the world like oj simpson in a white van or in a white ford bronco being chased on the highway and it was the most important thing that was going on in the world at the time and it really wasn't but it was entertaining and it got it got visit it got views it yes. got people ratings but it was like the first instance for me of really 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 reaffirming the idea that if it bleeds it leads it really and dominated our news everything. cycle and, and so discussions the, the, and the, everything. The, the chase. And so the the helicopters were out there watching the right. chase. The car cops were out there. All of us were glued to our TV worldwide. Yeah. We were watching this chase. And I remember for many years after this, there would be similar chases, though it didn't have the same kind of national following. But no. still, oh, there's a chase. Let's watch it. The helicopters are up there following you. Let's watch this chase. Right. And it kind of became a thing after it to follow police chases. And then, of course, the trial. Yeah itself you mentioned it lasted what nine months i think from beginning to, so to verdict long. very oh very gosh. long trial i don't know if this kicked off courtroom tv or it definitely brought it to the the, the forefront but it, you know we view this as the lead or the start of the courtroom tv phenomenon which you know maybe yep. led into the alex murdoch trial what we have everything now, any kind i think of everything trial. stems from it yes. yeah i think everything kind of stems from our weird voyeuristic design and also, it said everybody's like misinformation. Yeah, the OJ trial was pretty intense and it had a lot of stuff going on to it. But to hear people's commentary, even years later, right? I studied the OJ case when I was doing my my master's work. And I mean, it was 15 years removed from the OJ case. So a lot of the fanfare and a lot of the like hype around it. But man, like people's misinterpreting like opinions of OJ and guilt and innocence and even some of the idiotic video or, you know, made for TV movies that were put out that tell a narrative, like a, a narrative that they like want to feed into. It's just, it's crazy to me. It's like, this was the start of the romanticism of criminal trials in America. There you go.
if we are doing a top of five musings, memories of the OG Ooh. trial, number five is going to be the chase. And, and another yes. thing about the chase, though, which Absolutely. I find is, is fascinating, was what was found in the car after <laughs> the chase was done. I did not realize this at yes. the time. But now that I'm teaching a class on this, I, I found this out. Absolutely. Get this. He had cash. He had, uh, I think, a couple thousand dollars or so uh, have in that. cash. Because I guess if you're going to be on the run, you got to have some money to spend. He had a passport. Also, okay. kind of makes you think the guy's on Check. the run, bringing the passport, uh, leaving the country. He had a gun, I guess, to protect Check. himself. And then he had a fake mustache and beard. Now, I would have loved to have seen OJ. Absolutely. We're on a some kind of fake mustache and beard at a, at tell, a me, um... tell me it was blonde tell me it was a blonde mustache <laughs> and a blonde beard my goodness you can't make this stuff up i would have loved no. to see oj try that stuff on um oh absolutely no why at trial with the glove <laughs> it's one of the reasons why people thought that the um uh, the prosecution messed up the case was they put in no evidence of these things in the bronco no. chase though the white ford bronco chase uh does this kind of insinuate there's a certain level of guilt guilty people are on the run innocent people really generally do not run i don't know man i ha i hate that because i i don't when police come around to talk to me or want to engage with me i avoid them like the plague and i'm an innocent person i and i think you and i've also talked about this investigative techniques by the police are very lopsided in favor of the police yes so it's just better to not talk to them and to leave their vicinity. Now, I'm not saying that OJ was innocent by any means, and I'm not saying that the white Ford Bronco chase, you know, if the cops pull you over and try to lawfully detain you, there's there's rules that you have to abide by. And, you know, the the idea that the fact that he had these things on him are, are indicative of guilt is, again, the romanticism of the type of, you know, mastermind criminal, master of disguise, you know, shady cash is equivalent to crime. Guns are equivalent to crime. Okay, the beard and the mustache could be equivalent to crime. The fleeing is definitely equivalent to crime. But again, it's it's just bad takes at the end of the day. All right, number four on my list Ooh, of four. OJ trial musings, memories, the entrance of Cato Kalen. So My how, man. Did I say his name correctly that time? You did you did say Kato Caitlin correctly and okay. not Kato. That's gonna be a wheel of fortune one day. It's gonna be a, a before and after, and it's gonna be Kato Caitlin Clark. There you go. And we're gonna see that it's gonna be there. And I'm gonna win on Wheel of Fortune for that. He is like the forefront of all kinds of couch potato slash losers who where did this person come from yeah. sleeping on my couch. Uh he became Absolute a national alibi. celebrity because right. he was staying in OJ's house. And he was loyal to the juice. Man, For a that long guy was, time. Yeah, the, the 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 speculation of his lying under oath to protect OJ has been you know, historic. No, I do right? like yeah. He did Go say ahead. uh yesterday that he did hope that OJ cleared his conscience with his maker before his demise uh that kind of insinuates that he does think oj did it was guilty that yeah. you know, like you said it's kind of interesting and what does that mean about cato's role in his uh, testimony yeah. but uh there you go maybe they asked the wrong uh, questions but cato is now on record mm -hmm. as saying he believes the juice did it all right yeah number three after he lied and Helped him get off, but whatever. Number three on my list would be Mark Furman's perjury. Chris, yeah. I don't think we can fully understand how this case got derailed from the very, very beginning because of Mark Furman's involvement and subsequent perjury. Chris, I don't even know how this situation, this disaster of a verdict could have been avoided once you had Mark Furman's involvement. Here's what I'm talking about. From the very, yeah. very beginning, so Mark Furman and a couple other detectives like Nan Adder, they went over to Nicole Brown's place and they, and Mark Furman knew who Nicole was because he had responded to a spouse abuse couple call calls. a year yeah. earlier and knew that OJ and her were involving some spouse abuse situations. Uh, and so he immediately, in his mind, said, OJ's the guilty one. I mean, you know he had to think that. So then he Absolutely. goes over to OJ's house. 
you know, the Brentwood estate. And the thought was, is um, well, what do you think is the reason why they went over to OJ's place in the middle of the night? They claimed they went over to OJ's mm-hmm. place because of his, they feared for his safety. Eminent danger. I'm not buying that. No, so they jumped over the fence. They scaled OJ's fence because he was in imminent danger. Could he have been planting evidence at that point? I believe that is entirely possible. Now, that does not mean I believe OJ didn't do it. I believe that Mark Furman wanted to convict him, get an easy conviction, and was there at the scene at Nicole Brown's place, and then was Mm -hmm. the first to scale the fence there at OJ's uh, state. And now he said, well, okay, so did, really, did, Mark, did Mark Furman really plant evidence? Well, hold on to that thought just a bit, because right. during um, uh, the, the trial, Mark Furman was actually asked, after all this stuff came out about him using the N-word, uh, yeah. he, he was asked by um, uh, F. Lee Bailey if he'd ever used the N-word. He said, no, he had not. Well, it comes out later on, there was a videotape recording of him using it many, many, many Dropping times. Dropping it. Oh right. my gosh. So you get the perjury charges against Mark Furman. Uh, and, and so he, he's on the hot seat here at the, this trial. So they asked, so during one of these, 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 these questioning of Mark Furman, Evelyn Bailey asked him, so it, um, if I were to ask you if whether or not you planted evidence during the OJ Simpson investigation, what would your answer be? And Chris, do you know what his response was? I have on no the answer. Advice of my counsel, I'm going to take the fifth, plead the fifth no. amendment. You can't plead the fifth amendment when the question is, did you plant evidence? That's right. not I even mean, a thing. You can't do that. Right. Well, just put a pin in that real quick. The cast of characters that was the OJ trial, right? F. Lee Bailey, right? Johnny Cochran, Christopher Darden, Marshall. Like, I, you. F. Lee Bailey you is. Just, Historically, is in, he's in. How did F. Lee Bailey, one of the most historically respected lawyer, well, I mean, enough cash, you'll do, you'll do just about anything, but like you, Mark Furman, the the guy dropping n bombs left and right, and then getting on the stand and bold face telling the world and Judge Ito, I have never said the n word. Okay, well, let's roll tape, ladies and and this was pre like cell phone recording everything day, so you know, like he had to be proud of the fact that he dropped the n bomb a lot. And then to be able to take the fifth on, did you plant evidence? Nothing to me is clear evidence of, yeah, I did it. Then right. on advice of counsel, since I've already perjured myself once, I'm not going to do this a second time. We're not going to, because you know, Effley Bailey is going to be like, all right, well then let's roll the tape. Here I have you here, Mr. Furman going into the, th- oh, are those gloves? Oh, you dropped the glove. Oh, oh, is that the knife you just dropped? Okay, thanks. Bye. And this led to one of the great moments in the trial where um, the, the DNA expert for the for the defense was was on the stand yep. and they and he testified. I think, Chris, one of the things you want as a lawyer in trial is to relate to the jury, to tell Absolutely. a story, to create a mental picture that's just yep. lasting. And so this was a mental picture that this DNA expert um, left with the jury. So look, when, if you're eating a bowl of spaghetti and you see a cockroach in that bowl of spaghetti, what do you do? You throw away the entire bowl. You don't keep eating, wondering if you're going to find another cockroach in that bowl of spaghetti. You throw out the entire bowl. Same is true yeah. in this case. We have a li- we've already found some evidence of evidence planting. You throw away the entire case because you can now Absolutely. you cannot believe anything uh, that the prosecution that the detectives tell you in this case. We already found that one cockroach throw out the entire bowl of spaghetti. I thought that was a great uh, line by the yeah, DNA it's a great expert. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, absolutely. It, it, it hammered it home for people to understand. Everybody's had like a, you know, a fly in their soup or something like that. They know that you just, I'm gone. All right. Number two on my list. This one might surprise you. A star yeah. witness that you may, may or may not have mentioned. Maybe a, you it, it escaped your attention was Nicole's Akita dog. My, I know I started this podcast Aww. off with ratting out a bunch of uh, dogs like my stupid golden doodle that <laughs> gave me this black eye. Uh, but I do like dogs. And, and then Nicole, the story of Nicole's dog is kind of a sad story. Are you familiar with the story? I am not, and I would love for the listeners to hear it, too. All right. So, obviously, around 11 o'clock, Nicole and Ron Goldman were brutally murdered in front of Nicole's yep. place. Nicole's dog was there and was out mm-hmm. there snipping around her, uh, you know, master, 
Nicole and yep. you know obviously yeah, she had pat- yeah. she'd been murdered and so he then goes out and tries to get some help no one would listen to this dog finally some neighbor picked up this dog and tried to bring the dog in but the dog was restless and said no we need to go back outside so, so maybe he needs to to use the bathroom something so this neighbor who right. now has possession of the akita dog takes this dog outside and then that's when the dog leaves this person to her the master akita and that's how the mm-hmm. b- dead bodies were, were discovered from the akita dog so there you go a shout out to the canine world even though i ha- should not be doing that today hey man better detective than mark Furman. let me tell you that's right Just all right saying. number one this becomes a, a surprise to absolutely no one would be johnny cochran and johnny. the glove the yeah. glove don't fit you must have quit that is one of the most amazing scenes in courtroom history. You're having OJ, Absolutely. the juice, try on the glove. Do you know the story on how that came to be? Uh, I think it was. Actually, you know what? No, I have I have some speculation, but I want to hear what the actual story is. All right. So I read. Well, I don't know if this is the actual story. This is the actual story, according to F. Lee Bailey. And so you got you to wonder about that. But still, I'm pretty sure it's accurate. F. Lee Bailey said that Shapiro, you know, the uh, yep. Robert Shapiro, the attorney for OJ, was lingering around court one day around lunch mm-hmm. and the glove was there. And so he, Shapiro went and tried on the glove and realized this glove doesn't fit my hand. OJ's hands were immensely bigger bigger. than Shapiro's hands. And so at that point in time, the defense, according to F. Lee Bailey, really wanted OJ to try on that glove. The problem is the defense team couldn't do it. If the defense had OJ try on the glove, it would look like a stunt and it would have no pull in front of the jury. They needed the prosecution to to have OJ try it on and so they spent mm-hmm. the net, they then strategized how they could go to the prosecution. And so they would drop some things, some, some hints about what they might be doing just to try to go to Chris Darden into having OJ try on the glove. Marsha Clark was very much opposed to OJ trying on the glove. She did not think it was a good idea at all. And so right. she was vehemently opposed to it. But nonetheless, Chris Darden said, OJ, I want you to try on that glove. And you've got to watch the video. But I'll try to put the, the link here to the video uh, on the show tunes. But also, you can just Google it. Watch the video of OJ trying on the glove. Watch his face. He was coached. He is an actor. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And he is trying his hardest to keep down the smirk that's on his face as he is trying on the glove, struggling yeah. with trying on the glove, putting his hands in front of the jury. And at the very end, he does one of these numbers. Ta-da! This is how bad these gloves fit. Right, and it, like it just fit like just under his. If I remember correctly, it just fit barely onto his palm or something like that. It was just it was hilarious. Well, also I think Marsha Clark in her memoirs mentioned that the gloves were blood soaked and they were leather gloves, isotoners, and so they the leather constricted. So Marsha Clark was like, it's not going to fit his hand because of the situation around the blood and the glove and all that jazz. And I just remember Christopher Darden coming out. Like he, he thought he nailed it. He thought he was, he got OJ hook, line and sinker with the gloves. He thought, he thought he was King of the world. I remember later when I was studying it, watching the tape of how like cocky Christopher Darden was to be like, Oh, and OJ now go put on the glove and we're, and we're done and we're great. And OJ did the ta-da and Gosh, it blew up in his face. It, it sure did. Wow. All right. So that's my um, top of five musings, memories of the OJ yeah. trial. Chris, do you have any to time. add? Man, I would like Bob Shapiro. No, Rob the Kardashian. That, yes. That's yes. That's what Robert Kardashian. Rob Kardashian. And this is the one thing I hate about the OJ trial. Essentially launched this guy and his family into some sort of quasi stardom that has now ended in us having to keep up with the Kardashians. (laughs) That's right. OJ trial brought us the Kardashians. And man, Rob Kardashian, like F. Lee Bailey. Gosh, the guy was a genius. Had Rob Kardashian reactivate his law license because his law license was... um, inactive status okay had had him reactivate his law license 
So that way Rob Kardashian could never be called to the stand. Yeah. Could never be forced to give any sort of, of testimony against the juice. Had anything that Rob had done with OJ, because Rob and OJ were friends and OJ Personal paid Rob. Personal friends since USC yeah. days. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and OJ had paid Rob for some consulting stuff and all that jazz. But once you put the the lawyer tag on, all that's confidential and you can't yes. bring it up. So again, F. Lee Bailey being a, a master of the legal system and a master of of all things trial related was just a really smart move to make. That, is, Rob that was a good move because because if you don't remember, OJ went to Kardashian's place right after yeah. the 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 arrest or. Yeah, right before the arrest when they're trying to do the handoff of the arrest and so he stayed at kardashian's place so kardashian would have been involved yeah. imminently in how oj right. uh turned himself in and what oj might have told him during that time his his character assessment of oj over the previous yep. you know several Absolutely. several years and because he's a lawyer on the case they really cannot call him as a witness so yeah great Absolutely. move by shapiro absolutely All so right. that was that's my other that's my what is that you know honorable mention there you go the juice is now loose hey what a great yep. segue to donald trump <laughs> one wrongfully convicted person to another i'll just leave it at that all right OJ. oj wasn't wrongfully convicted he was convicted of robbing a casino on tape like that's what he got convicted of he was exonerated we didn't even talk so about wrong that one Ooh, wrongfully exonerated people donald trump and oj simpson wrongfully exonerated i'm here for this was that the freudian slip of the, of the day it could have been <laughs> so, right good uh, donald trump's trial you say joel you got to be clearer than that what trial are you talking about there's yeah, so one? many different trials did i say there trials or campaign stops one of the two i don't know uh his next campaign stop is going to be in new york in front of a jury <laughs> next monday he's going to be on trial for right. false records act violation now this is one of the um I, i'm already on record of saying charges. many ridiculous charges against trump thank you for for reminding me of this is a ridiculous charge against trump uh -huh. what this case is about is is donald trump paid hush money to stormy daniels uh through his attorney right before the election in 2016. was that a campaign violation was an improper campaign contribution uh wh whatever that was that that was done and how was that then recorded because mm -hmm. under new york if you record information incorrectly it is a crime and so that's yep. what this case is about chris let's start with this uh, right off the top, this is a ridiculous charge, in my opinion. This is not That's a right. campaign violation. Donald That's Trump right. is allowed wholeheartedly to spend his money to to pay someone to keep them quiet. We call them uh, NDAs, non-disclosure agreements. It happens in law all mm -hmm. the time. Now, it doesn't happen with, with porn stars. You know, that that's kind of salacious. That's a salacious detail that we add here. It's right. kind of fun. This also is a presidential election. But Chris, it, we know we have these campaign finance laws. They do not apply when you are spending your own money. You can spend as much money as you want <laughs> uh, to get yourself elected president. So the hush money payments, not yes. illegal. Uh, the fact you, you have to record it the correct way. <laughs> you have to give yourself a loan to the campaign, no, you have not to just record it as a loan, and then you have to forgive the loan at the end of the campaign. If you're spending your own money, you can spend your That's own money. That's how you money. have to do it. No, you have to give yourself a loan. You have to loan the campaign money. It's not, I can't Chris Marone pull out of Chris Marone's bank account and pay for all these campaign things. Now we can debate whether or not paying Stormy Daniels was a campaign thing or not, because I would actually argue that it wasn't. Paying a, a, a porn star hush money, I don't think is a campaign expense which is what i would argue i'd argue that it is a trying to stay married expense right um but and unfortunately in campaign, unfortunately yeah. for donald trump's life this is just normal i mean normal this is a normal course of business it is not a campaign <laughs> violation to engage in these kind of things in the normal course of business to spend money in the normal course of business even if it does impact your ability to be elected to a to a federal office so I, Everything I don't think the underlying charge is that serious at all. And under New York, there is this idea of how were these records kept? Because if you kept them under the wrong name, that is a violation of the False Records Act in New York, apparently to, to throw a person in, in jail. All right, so let's mm -hmm. analyze that. Who do you think 
is in charge of keeping Donald Trump's records. Hmm. Would hmm. it be Donald Trump himself or maybe his accountant or lawyer? Now, if he told his lawyer, I want this recorded as a um, as legal expense, XYZ. then yeah. it would have been the lawyer's job then to do this, which could have easily been done. I've done this. Not This is that kind of detail, but very similar when you're talking about a lawyer mm -hmm. paying expenses on behalf of a client. You can have a retainer agreement where this is paid out pursuant to the lawyer's job. You could, mm -hmm. The lawyer could have arranged that. If Donald right. Trump's instructions were make this a legal expense, Michael Cohen could have done that. So if it was not done, Michael Cohen, my eyes are on you. Why did you not do that? Why did you not create a retainer with Donald Trump where Donald Trump paid you so much money as a retainer and then you paid out? the legal fees and expenses from that retainer. Why was that not done, Michael Cohen? All right, those are my initial thoughts. The, yeah, um, I also am unsure of the legality of the NDA, right? I'm I'm essentially paying you for sex. No, I'm, no, not I'm, paying for sex no, to keep it quiet. This is, right, so the, this, is, this is the, the, the prostitution argument all the time. I'm not paying the woman to have sex with me. I'm paying her to leave. But so but it's not is... prostitution. It's not. I'm not paying her to have sex with me. I'm paying her to leave. So it's I, not prostitution. I do get that. And it's that. the same argument. But I don't think there's any insinuation that he paid this hush money as she was leaving the hotel room. I mean, this would have been done. No, 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 a no, long no, no. Time I'm just saying. Later. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not paying her to have sex with me. I'm paying her to not talk about having sex with me. Right. That's. That, that the insinuation is that the NDA and and what Stormy Daniels did and what Donald Trump did was that I'm not paying you for the act of sex. We engaged in that because we're consenting adults. But what I am paying you is to not go tell people that you had sex with at the time a nobody and now a presidential candidate. So by the way, Chris, I'm gonna get your thoughts on this one because I'm pretty sure I know what your thoughts are gonna be. Yeah. But Another one of our favorite lawyers, because he's so good for giving us content, would be Michael Absolutely. Avenatti, who's spending time right oh, now good in old prison. Mikey. He wanted yep, to be himself. in the press uh, lately because I thought, oh well, why gosh. not? But talking about Stormy Daniels, why not get my name back in front of the, of the, in the headlines? So he, attention whore. he came out last week and said, Stormy Daniels lied. Uh, and so, yes, she was my client. Yes, I did represent her in these hush money payments. And other kind of payments, but, she never but had I, sex with him. I didn't find out she never had sex with them. Yeah, she she lied about it. But can you really believe Michael Avenatti? I don't the know. The same way I can believe Michael Cohen and the same way I can believe Donald Trump. They're all really just like one amorphous blob of white privilege. <laughs> so like, speaking of that, great segue to our next topic, which is since these are all a bunch of New Yorkers who love to be in the, the headlines, and one yeah. of them is the former president of the United States, how can you actually get a fair and unbiased jury? And so that's what next mm -hmm. week is going to be all about. Can is it weird. possible yeah. for Donald Trump to have a fair and unbiased jury decide his case? Chris, I think this is going to be a huge issue. This is the issue that might yeah. go up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Because if the jury ends up being 12 Democrats who voted against him, how is that going to be fair? But where are you going to find a fair and unbiased jury for Donald Trump? Like, biased for him or biased against him, Donald Trump is one of the most famous individuals, which was his plan all along, famous individuals on the face of the planet, right? You're, you, I, I would say you were hard-pressed to find an unbiased jury anywhere in the United States for Donald Trump. Just the, the mention of the name of Donald Trump, people have opinions. Nobody has an indifferent view of Donald Trump. I, I, it's I, one camp or the other. I do agree with that. So then you should at least try to make it 50-50. Now, in New York City, they voted against Trump 88-12 to 12 in the last election. I don't know where the current so, polling stands, but that's what it was. So where would you go? Well, let's say we put race on top of this uh, because I think there are – even though they're not totally analogous, there are some similarities between the two comparisons. Mm -hmm. If you are a person of, of one race and you had a jury pool made up of 100% another race, 
that's going to be a problem. Even though theoretically you should be able to be fair and unbalanced and put those issues aside and, and decide the case fairly and impartially, when it comes to race, the Supreme Court has said, no, that's too hard to do. People are entitled to a fair and, and a, a jury of their peers. And when you have the jury made up of entirely a different race, that's not going to be fair. It's going to be a, a, a Sixth Amendment violation. All right. right can you make some race- more Right. Can you Race make it is sim- an immutable characteristic? Being an asshole is not. No, no, like, but but being fair and unbalanced is very similar. Now, I get that the difference is there, but if the issue is, yeah. is it a fair and imbalanced juror, and they're all 100% Democrats who did not like me, and we all can agree that Donald Trump rubs people the wrong way. And so if you're one of the sides that hate him, is that really but fair? The, but also Republicans hate him. True. So now, so now you're trying to drill down to find where Donald Trump can get a jury of people who like him. No, well, or or where it's fifty fifty, yeah. where it's fifty fifty. But, but but so now you have to you have to as a prosecuting body find a location, right? Or as a judge, find a venue where. 50% of the people like Donald Trump and 50% of the people don't like Donald Trump. And guess what? Like, that's not a legal standard. Well, there was so, a motion to change the venue last week right. and the court denied it. And and so there because, was a motion. It is preserved right. for appeal. It is. And, and when you get it on to appeal, how, and how do you determine that? How do you determine a venue where 50% of the people are going to like Donald Trump and 50% of the people aren't going to like Donald Trump? I don't know if you have to argue that on appeal or if you just have to simply say in New York City, it's 88 to 12. Now, again, it's, mm-hmm. it's going to make a difference what this jury ends up looking like. If the jury ends up looking like 100 to 0, that's going to be a problem for the prosecution. If it's 80 to 12, you know, right. eight, you know, I don't know, 9 to 3? Okay, they might say but that's a... How do you, how do you test that? What do, you, do you just go, did you vote for Donald Trump? How do you feel about Donald Trump? Well, he's an a-hole. You're going to get that from Republicans, Democrats, and everybody else. So you have to get somebody on there that says, well, I think Donald Trump's a good guy. No, like that's not a that's not a valid jury question. Well, I would what assume the defendant. I would assume the lawyers for, for Donald Trump said, we want to ask that question. And if the court says, no, I'm not going to let you ask that question during voir dire, that's another appealable right. issue. Why can't we ask that question? But you will also know, because unlike the civil case in, the, in New York City, this criminal case, yeah. the lawyers will know the identity of the, um, the jurors. Uh, the oh, jurors. Yeah. Now, the public won't know it, but the lawyers will. And so they'll do their research and find out how did you register. So we'll know, do we have a Republican, a registered Republican on this list? Or is it 12 to 0 you know what however that might end up being they will actually have that information so they can appeal from that right which is asinine to me that they're going to repeat they're going to appeal based on political party like somehow that the political party (laughs) is going to is going to cloud the like that's gosh i mean this is this is part of the reason why i really 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 dislike the direction the legal system is going right now because judges will entertain the idea that political party has somehow going to dominate your opinion because again republicans and democrats do not like donald trump and republicans and democrats can be swayed one way or another to say in this one instance donald trump did nothing wrong or in this one instance donald trump did something wrong it's just it is going to be, I think it's going to be a huge is issue is. for appeal because how, if this jury, jury ends up looking like a, a Democratic rally of, of, of 100%, 12 jurors that do not like Donald Trump, that's going to be a huge problem for the prosecution to come appeal. And also from the PR standpoint, because be, the public won't accept it. Yes, they will. Outside of New absolutely, York, absolutely. if you have 12 absolutely. jurors who are all Trump haters, the public will not accept that. If you have 12 jurors <laughs> that come... The, the it is asinine to me that all of a sudden Donald Trump gets special service. All of a sudden Donald Trump gets to be put up on a pedestal and get some sort of special dude. You get the jury you get in the crime in the area that you committed. Yeah, we're gonna try our best to find twelve people that represent that are your peers. Guess what, man? That's the roll of the dice. Don't you know that it is what it is. Like no one else, no one else in any other criminal trial would look at a jury and go, hmm, nope, it's no, 12 it, Democrats. No, or, everyone, hmm. 
Yeah, right. But obviously, in most cases, Donald Trump politics don't even play privilege. a part. Here, politics is going to play every bit of part because, of, of this case. Which is idiotic because politics play a part because that's the well i mean and you said it to begin with these are all trump campaign stops yeah you you want that's all, this that's case, all they are you want this case being decided based upon the law and facts of this case and not based upon right. your preconceived idea on who donald trump is i hear from a lot of people just convict him because he deserves it he's donald trump okay i, I get that at a certain level but that's not how the law works under the constitution everyone is entitled if they are being right. charged with a crime to have that issue right. being decided by a fair and impartial jury pool and so here i think that's going to be a huge issue can trump get a fair and balanced un unprejudiced uh jury pool but the trump can't the trump campaign is already saying and you echoed it that he can't and it's and he can't he absolutely can't we we don't have a perfect justice system we have the best one that we have. So if it comes out and it's 12 people and it's five Republicans and 12 them and and seven Democrats and they all come out and say, yeah, Donald Trump's guilty, the the narrative is going to now be nope, they all are Trump haters. They're all Trump haters. Every one of them is a Trump hater. Man, it's going to be hard pressed for you to find non-Trump haters anywhere on the eastern seaboard. All right, let's actually and if that's analyze. your response is if that's your deal is that well they have to like Trump no, people don't like criminal defendants in general, whether they're Trump or not. All right, Karen Friedman Agnafilo, a CNN legal analyst and a former prosecutor okay. in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, was okay. doing some analysis as to what kind of juror Trump and the prosecution would want. I don't know if you've given that any thought, but according to her, Trump's attorneys will be looking for jurors who are, well, obviously, of course, it's sympathetic to Trump. Let's set that aside. That's a, a, a no-brainer. Uh, yeah, but they will be thing. looking for an independent thinker, someone who's willing to stand up. And when the other 11 say, let's convict and let's go out now, you the Trump's going to want someone who actually yep. will say, no, let's hold this up. Because, Chris, again, Trump is not going to be exonerated no. here. There's no way Trump is going to get an, uh, uh, a not guilty verdict. It's going to be either guilty or it's going to be a hung jury. So right. they're going for the hung jury. Get that one yep. holdout. Absolutely. So they want to make sure they have some strong-minded individuals who would be willing to hold up the entire ordeal. Right. And, and you know, not like the people over there in the Murdoch trial. I don't know if you, if you follow the Murdoch trial, but there were a couple right. that d voted not guilty, or at least – not, they, they did not vote guilty during the first mm -hmm. um, uh, polling that they did. Well, they quickly changed their mind within about 20 minutes. They don't want that here. They don't they want someone who believes yeah. the prosecution has not proven their case, and I'm going to hold this entire thing up until um, um, you know this person's right. issues are, are resolved. Okay. Right. They want to. They want a 12 angry men. Right. So right. the um, who will the prosecution be looking for? Well, the prosecution will be looking for someone like a parent, uh, someone who regularly has to make decisions on the fly, hears from both sides, and then makes a quick decision. And so according right. to this former pros Manhattan prosecutor, she said that sometimes parents are always good because parents have to listen to what their kid is saying, and sometimes they have to make a credibility determination. Is he telling the truth? Is he not telling the truth? This seems rather sexist to me, but whatever. Uh, right. And so at least that's... Have you given any thought as to what type of juror Trump's lawyers will be wanting as compared to what kind of juror the prosecutors will be looking for absolutely the type of person that trump's lawyer is going to want to go for is probably somewhere affluent uh preferably male i would assume um maybe upper middle class upper class is what they're looking for someone who can relate to to the the plight of donald trump someone who's been um who's susceptible to his rhetoric um someone who may or may not um does the you know the line of you know kind of boys will be boys and you know banging porn stars is a really great thing and it's not really a crime it's an nda stuff like they're looking for somebody who can rationalize um and relate to donald trump or somebody who idolizes and likes to look up to donald trump which that's who I want for everybody's criminal. I want someone who idolizes my criminal defendant. I want someone who can relate to my criminal defendant. I want someone who can see what my defendant does and rationalize their behavior. Those are the things I was looking for. If I was a, if I was the prosecutor, um, yeah, maybe a parent archetype, or I'd want somebody who's more emotional, 
someone who has a knee jerk reaction, someone who um, is offended easily, someone that has probably uh, deep religious mm -hmm. beliefs. Like I would love a good number of Catholics on there to talk about adultery and really hammer hard, like the moral violations that this man gave, um, you know, the pounding the law, that's the gray area, but I want, I would, as a prosecutor, I'd want to paint the picture of a cheating husband who mm -hmm. thinks it's his right to be able to have sex with every woman on the face of the planet and then pay them off. Like there's some sort of service for him. Right. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even dig into the political stuff. I'd more focus on the idea that, you know, he's the type of guy that would take advantage of your daughter. So I'd want young fathers or mid fathers of teenagers like teenage girls, stuff like that. Those are the the stuff I would try to dig into. Interesting. Well, jury selection will begin yeah. on a Monday. They'll bring in 100 prospective jurors at a time to see if they can't find 12 fair and unbiased jurors from that group. And then we'll keep going mm -hmm. through different 100-person groups. And I do think there's going to be also a problem of people wanting desperately to be on this oh my jury gosh, pool yeah. because, obviously, number one is the Trump trial. But number two, this is a million-dollar lottery ticket. You'll have a Absolutely. book deal guaranteed oh at the end of this trial. So they will be wanting yeah. to conceal information, and it's going to be the lawyer's job to try to dig out and uncover any kind of undisclosed bias. So oh we gosh. will be following this trial every single week because this is going to be an amazing, yep. huge, one of the trials of the centuries. And again, I actually have a legal theory that would win this case for Donald Trump, whether or not the defense team chooses to call me up. I have no, they have not called me up yet, uh, okay. but hey, I have the theory that would win the day for Donald Trump and it's going to be basically twofold. One, Donald Trump, lawyers, you need to argue this was not a campaign of violation. This is standard lawyer practice. Mm -hmm. It's called an NDA. That's demystify this idea as being hush money payments to a porn star. Number two, right. if the instruction was to do this NDA in a legal way, that's not on Donald Trump. That's on his lawyers to find out how to do that. Donald Trump would say, you need to record this information as an legal expense. Well, guess what? lawyers figure out a way to do that if you messed up that's on you that's not on the client uh and so you just gotta destigmatize these charges and show how legal this transaction is that's how i would posture this case i begin i don't really think that's the issue here though it really could be because we're talking yeah. about jail time here so they actually need to win this case this has to be more than just a campaign stop yeah. Chris, we don't really have time Listen. to cover the next issue, which is this next week at the Supreme Court, the Supreme oh Court is going to yeah. take up the issue of oh, wow. a January 6th defendant's trial. And so now finally, the yeah, January we're gonna check 6th that next week. issues are now before the U.S. Supreme Court. And they are tr one of the defenses trying to throw out an obstruction charge saying this really it wasn't meant for these, this type of purpose. And that case is now before the U.S. Supreme Court. People really don't care about that issue as much as they care about this issue. Donald Trump also has an obstruction charge, a very similar issue in another right. case. So the Supreme Court's ruling in here, how might that apply to Donald Trump's obstruction charge case? That's going to be what people are watching. <laughs> yeah. For All next, right. Well, we'll hit that hard next week. Yes. Next up is our courtroom quarterback segment. No, no, no. All right, so, so we music. have some time now to talk sports. We do this at the end of the yeah. podcast because this is primarily a lawyer podcast, but we like to talk sports, and yep. we just want to do that. And so I don't know, Chris, are we trying to audition to be on ESPN? Is that what we're doing here? Man, I, you know, I've watched a lot of ESPN in my lifetime, and I think that's what I want to do in retirement. I, I think, think I want to be a sportscaster or, you know maybe i'll just go back and call like high school baseball games in my retirement and just you know bring out the sure mic and just sit there and be like just a bit outside i think we have better hotter takes than espn does and so i do too let's talk about the caitlin clark controversy Good job. there you go there's no I controversy there's no con you're just mad because she beat a KU Jayhawk. And, and we're talking about KU great. And I'm not talking as yeah, much about yeah. this record. I'm talking about records in general. But we're going to use this as my launching pad for my right. my soapbox, whatever you want, right. diatribe. All right. 
So here's the deal. Caitlin Clark this last year broke the all-time scoring record for women um, basketball players. Then she also broke the all-time record for men and women. Okay. But I'm focusing here on the women's side, which also probably would apply to the men's side as well. But um, Lynette Woodard, the great basketball player for the KU Jayhawks, Rock Chalk Jayhawk at KU. I know we did not have the best of seasons this year, but, you know, still we have a great history, not just on our men's side, which people know about. Wilt the Stilt Chamberlain played for us. Mm -hmm. Um, Danny Manning played for us. Paul Pierce. We have a lot of great greats on the men's side, but we also have some greats on the women's side. And Lynette Woodard was the all-time scoring champion in female college basketball. In what year? Until, oh, was this, I don't know. I'm going to go back to the 60s and 70s. Now you're really dating me. Uh, mm-hmm. It was before my time. I don't remember yes, this. very much so. I started well, watching. it was before the three-point line, so come on. Like, I, it was a while ago. I started watching KU basketball in like the 1980s. Uh, and so it was before then. Actually, it was, I started watching in 84, I think it was, during the Danny okay. Manning era. Larry Brown era, the year before we won the national title. So. Nonetheless, on the female side, Lynette Woodard, Mm -hmm. uh, and while I'm talking, maybe I might Google this and see when she did play for the KU Jayhawks, she set the all-time scoring record for collegiate female basketball. But during that, and so now she is coming out and saying Mm -hmm. that Caitlin Clark, even though Lynette Woodard was there when Caitlin Clark beat her record and she congratulated her like she should, she now came out and said, well, she really didn't break my record. Okay, what does she mean by that? And I think there's a real good discussion point here as to why do we even have records? What's the purpose of records, which we need to talk about. But let's first unpack what was Lynette Woodard saying. Lynette Woodard was saying when she played basketball, the female Mm -hmm. basketball was the same size as the men's of basketball. And after her era, they reduced the size of the female basketball. Chris, have you ever shot with a female basketball? Yeah, it's smaller than the male basketball. I have. And I tell you what, it is easier. I I can actually drain. I say drain. I use that term loosely. A lot of three-pointers, a lot of jump shots. And I go, man, because I used to coach in the Upwards Basketball League. And so we'd hang out there. We'd use the female size basketball. I was shooting with it quite a lot. I'm thinking, man, I'm a really good shooter. I'm making a lot of these shots. Well, it's it's smaller than the men's basketball. The men's basketball is larger, and so your margin of error for the accuracy of your shot is so much gr- less when it comes to shooting the male basketball than the female basketball. And if you don't believe me, just go try it. You will see for yourself the difference. I, so Lynette Woodard's position was she had to shoot with the bigger basketball and they did not have a three-point line during Lynette Wooder's time. Now, does that make a difference? Well, Kaylin Clark had over almost 500 three-pointers, that, you know, during her, her t- mm-hmm. tenure. So, yeah, that's 500 extra points that she was able to score because she had the three-point basket uh, and Lynette Woodard did not. All right, Chris, first of all, what are your takes on the KU great Lynette Woodard's uh, sour grapes? They're just that. Right. They're, they're just that she like, I'm Googling her right now. That's why my eyes aren't focused on the camera right now. Look, get over it. You want to, you, you, okay, you had I, a college, you had a college record. You had, you played in a different game. You played from 77 to 81. You didn't have a three point line. The game has changed. The game has changed. So do you want to freeze? You want to freeze your scoring title and hold it out separate than the other scoring title. Great. You and your little crowd of cronies that are going to hang around. The, the desire to be in the limelight should have been passing the torch to the next great player, right? The, 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 the win for college for women's college basketball with Caitlin Clark, whether you're like, Oh, let's split hairs on the three point line and on the size of the ball mediocre people want to split hairs when they see greatness because they are they cannot achieve what that person has done okay but can you yeah no there's no splitting hairs at this point caitlin clark beat the record but can you not see her point because i see this no i'm not seeing her point in different sports let's just say because you want to look you look the, the only game every sporting team 
has changed over time. So you're going to compare Babe Ruth as the greatest of all time to Shohei Otani. You're going to get different things every single. Are you going to contend, are you going to compare Ted Williams to and his batting average to, um, gosh, pick Greg Maddox or no, to I, I get batting average because that is a fair statistic to no, compare it's not across because generations. the game, no, it's not because when. When Ted Williams was playing baseball, the fastest pitch was 87 miles an hour. But now, look, when other people are playing baseball, the fastest pitch is 107 miles an hour, and we have all this data around it. No, the I, sport I, has grown and changed. So you can't compare past generations to currently. And when you do that, you demean the fact that the game has to evolve to meet the the changing technologies and the ability to train. Look, guy, you, you look at Babe Ruth and Ted Williams, and I'm using baseball specifically because it, it has changed the least over the years. Those guys went to war for four or five seasons and then came back and still played the game. So are we to say that those guys are so much better than Nolan, you know, Nolan Ryan, who never went to war? Well, now we're comparing, again, apples and oranges. Caitlin Clark beat the scoring record of Pistol Pete Maravich, who is arguably the greatest shooter of all times, who we never talk about, and Lynette Woodward, their records were beaten, and the and it is on nobody else but Lynette Woodward and Caitlin Clark. They neither of them, neither of those two players, had control over how the NCAA changed the game. Oh, I, I agree, but I also think that you have to admit that there are some differences. For example, I and I use a comparison to to let's just say a baseball. Let's say Babe Ruth has set the home run record, and it was a, the season long home run record. How many home runs do you hit in a season? And during Babe Ruth's era, let's just say they had a hundred and. 54 games, and today you have 162. So you have eight more games in which to hit home runs. That's a okay. factor. So if the record is how many home runs did you hit in a season, when you have a season that has a lot more games, you have to factor that in in your mind. In football, it's the same thing. You have a rushing record, let's just say, that Jim Brown okay. created. Well, Jim yeah. Brown ran when there was 12 games in a season. Now there are 17 games in the season. You can't compare, you know, uh, um, Browns, you know, um, ru your rushing totals to the rushing totals of running backs today who have you a totally lot can. more games to play. Now when it comes because to your... You're not, yeah, you, you can because now you're not taking into all the other factors that have changed in the NFL as well. Defensive rules, shifts, what what refs are calling now, what, you know, the the concussion protocol... All of these changes, you can't just isolate one stat and say, oh, it's the men's ball versus the women's ball. N no. Right, right. So many other things have changed within the game that has leveled the playing field of, of these stats. Yeah, you We want to compare one-to-one -one stats because it's easy, when in fact it's not because the game has changed so much that, yeah, she may have a smaller ball, but now let's look at the different uh, – the the size of you know teams or the recruiting efforts or how much time does Caitlin Clark spend in the lab every offseason like there's a lot of things that have changed throughout the game when she, when Lynette Woodward women's basketball didn't have have as as much I mean as much funding or equal funding as they do now so right. you, it's it's apples to oranges and right now the the scoring number is a number. And Caitlin Clark beat it. And I, Lynette should congratulate her and call it a day. Which, Same which, way with everybody. Hank Aaron should have congratulated Barry Bonds and called it a day. Which, for the record, Lynette Woodard did uh, congratulate did. her. She attended it. Yeah. And even after her comments, she also said, hey, Caitlin Clark is the record holder. She holds the record. So she's not saying that the record does not belong to 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 Caitlin. Caitlin Clark. But again, I think your point is valid. And that's why I'm actually driving to another greater point here, because that's what we do here at the Community of Law Podcast. We always beseech for the greater truth here. And that mm -hmm. is this. What is the purpose of records? I think records to are break meant to be broken. Why? Absolutely. That creates interest in the here yeah. and now. The people today are watching are saying, this is cool. The young kids say, oh, look, I saw the person who set that record. Now, you want records to mean something, but still, they're meant to be broken. You want to right. see people right. chasing records, achieving that milestone, and breaking that record. Okay, so Absolutely. I, I get that. But here's, a, here's my beef. 
What I don't like is when people then make the immediate connection to say, oh, look, you broke the record, thus you are the unquestioned GOAT. No, I don't think that makes you the unquestioned GOAT. I think it's an argument you can make, but not the unquestioned because people think, face different things in different generations. Yeah. And, and so it's an art like Tom Brady. Is he really the unquestioned goat over Sammy Harbaugh? You don't even, we don't even remember Sammy Harbaugh or Johnny Unitas. No. So you had that yeah. recent bias Broadway playing Joe. in there as well, but it's just hard to say, thus you are the unquestioned goat because you set this record. No, no, you're, you're the record holder because records are meant to be broken. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Now we have interest. And I hope next year someone breaks your record. But that doesn't make you the unquestioned goat. We use the word goat way too often. We we use the word, the words, greatest of all times, way, way, way too frequently. Because if you are the greatest of all time, that's one of you. That that that's it. In in you have is Tom Brady the the best quarterback of the 90s, 2000s, and 2010s? Absolutely. I'll give him that. I'll right. give him 30 years of greatness. He's got my vote. Is he the unquestioned greatest of all times? Absolutely not. Because there's guys like Bart Starbaugh that had to develop the sport. Right. Right? That, that, that didn't have a system like the NFL. Like, they were just figuring it out. Does that make, does, does that make his sacrifice any less? No. But... We use greatest of all time. Do I think that Caitlin Clark is going to be remembered as a, a phenomenal college player and a trend and a, a, a blazer of, you know, people's intrigue more into women's sports? You know, the, the resurgence of watching women's sports. I don't know. Do I hope so? Yeah. Cause the Iowa games and, you know, um, Paige on UConn, I can't think of her last name right now. And the girl from LSU who I can't remember her name right now. And that's on me. Reese. Like those are great players. And they deserve the limelight for their skills. Does the does the WNBA need? Should the WNBA be watched more? Yeah, it's entertaining basketball. But to say that you're the goat and he's the goat and Muhammad Ali's the goat, but Mike Tyson's the goat, you don't get to have multiple greatest of all time. That's not what the greatest of all time is. It is a singular title. Yes, there can be one. There you go. We resolve the issue. We brought some clarity Damn. to the madness. It's about the discussion. It's about mm -hmm. the debate. It's because we have nothing better to do with our times. Hey, Chris, That's speaking true. of which, I guess we Super do early. need to do better things with our time. So we got to <laughs> cut this podcast short here uh, and get on with our billable hours. Have a great Absolutely. week out there. You're starting to, I assume, suffocate in the, the immense heat. Uh, the final 14s have left. But hey, have a great week, and we'll see you next week. We'll see you next week, Joel. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give us a five-star review. We need your love to help us continue highlighting the funnier side of the law. I want to give a special shout-out to our Vice President of Operations, Wendy Oster, without whom this entire operation would be a complete and utter mess. Sean Wynn and 15 Five Features for making me sound way better than I actually do. Brooke Bolin for our marketing efforts. And Ryan Kuhn and Paul Kuhn of Tri. Plus City Marketing for our technical and computer support.